just um, just out of curiosity, how, how many people are familiar with this title? This is actually the name of the movie. Nobody here. I was afraid of that. I mean, this is kind of a U.S. This is a U.S. centric talk. So this was a movie that was, I think, in the fifties. Uh, it's an old movie. It was about uh, some small town in a valley in Wales in the UK. Um, but it's kind of relevant because the topic of this talk, at least, the whole talk is basically based around this idea of a vegetation index. The idea here is that um, you can basically, based on an image, figure out how much vegetation there is in the picture. Uh, and it, the way it does that is it uses this calculation is called NDVI. And, and really what it boils down to is it's a normalized value where you take the, the difference between the amount of near infrared and red light, and you divide it by the total of the two. And it, because it turns out that vegetation absorbs red light really well, but it doesn't absorb near infrared very well. So the difference in those two is a very good indication of how much vegetation is on the ground. So further, um, the data I'm using here, primarily at least for the vegetation index, comes from a satellite um, called MODIS. Uh, the US put up two satellites, two MODIS satellites. Um, they collect a lot of data. Um, but one set of data that is in particular interest for this talk is something called Mod 13A1. And this is captured, you know, when you read their site, it says about every 16 days when you actually download the data, it looks like they do it a bit more frequently than that. Uh, it comes in different resolutions. So I chose the 500 meter spatial resolution. What that means is that basically every pixel in the image represents a 500 meter square. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll go through how you get the data. Uh, you can also get 250 meter resolution and one kilometer resolution. You can, as you can imagine, since this is a two-dimensional problem, at 250 meter resolution, the amount of data you would download would be four times as much. And there was a lot of data here, so the 500 was kind of a good compromise, but you can get better resolution or you can get, you know, the more coarse grain if you wanted. It's used, this, this particular satellite data is used for monitoring of vegetation conditions globally. And it's, there's all kinds of uses for it. I mean, it can be used for hydrologic modeling, for agricultural forecasting, land use planning, um, you know, forest coverage, those kinds of things. Um, now, in this talk, I'm also kind of, in addition to the vegetation index data, I'm going to cover a bit on administrative shape data and geocoded data. So how many people here are familiar with geocoding? One, two? Well, geocoding is basically the process of taking uh, an address, like a street address, and converting it into Latin long, essentially. And administrative shape data are things like the boundaries of cities or the boundaries of countries. Um, and again, I'll go into that in a little bit more detail as I go through the talk, how I'm using that. The components that I use for this talk, as you would expect, being at a Postgres conference includes Postgres. Uh, and I'm also using PostGIS because it's a spatial talk. Um, how many people here are familiar with R? Oh, that's good. A handful of people. That's, that's nice. So PLR is an extension for, to Postgres that I wrote and maintain with help of a couple other people at this point, which is nice. Um, it, uh, it's basically the procedural language handler for R for Postgres. So if you're familiar with the way Postgres works, it's very extensible. One of the ways Postgres can be extended is by adding procedural language handlers. So Postgres ships with, for instance, PL Perl, PL Python. Those are procedural language handlers that let you write functions inside of Postgres in those languages. 
PLR is the exact same thing. It doesn't ship with Postgres. It's available on GitHub. It's also distributed. Uh, Devrim distributes it with the RPMs for the Postgres development group. It's distributed by the, uh, the guys who do the packaging for the Debians. So it is generally available. You can compile it easily enough on Linux. On Windows, good luck. I do usually make a Windows DLL like uh, once a year when Postgres comes out with a new version, but it's it's not for the the faint of heart. Um, so please, if you want to use this stuff, do it on Linux, please. So in terms of setting the things up so that you can go through these slides. Um, you would need to install your desired versions of Postgres, PostGIS, R, and PLR. I wrote this talk maybe a year ago, so the, the versions are all, I think, based on like Postgres 10, uh, whatever PostGIS was at the time, I'm not even sure. Um, R is, you know, like at version 3.5 or something. Uh, generally speaking, none of that should matter. You should be able to use the most current versions now and it should all just work. Um, you create the database and install the ex extensions. There's a number of packages. Um, the R community is actually kind of well-renowned for their extensibility as well, and they have a really good, I mean, if you're familiar with, like with Perl has CPAN, where they have all their extensions. Well, the R community has something called CRAN with all of their extensions, and there's something like 10,000 extension packages for R, it's, it's a huge ecosystem of extensions for R. And I think it's fair to say that for at least the last five or 10 years, most of the, the new types of analysis that are being developed in the universities, the first place it gets implemented is in, R, in an R package. So much to the point where if you're familiar with the other, the commercial vendor, you know, Oracle is to Postgres, well, in the, in the statistics world, SAS is to R. And SAS has a plugin that lets it run R. Oracle has a plugin that lets it run R. SQL Server actually has a plugin that lets it run R now. Um, but PLR was first by like 10 years for Postgres. So, you know, I'm not going to try and go through all of that, but suffice it to say, if you're interested in, in R and what it can do, you go to the CRAN page, which is just cran.r-project.org, and if you look on that page, there's something called task views, and the task views kind of break down all of these packages into areas of interest, and one of the areas of interest is spatial. So if you go to the task view for spatial, it'll show you a whole long list of different packages that different do different kinds of spatial analytics in R. Now, I, I, there's a note here. Um, if you go through this, be sure to install the R packages either as root or as the user of Postgres. And the reason is when PLR runs inside of Postgres, it's running effectively as the Postgres user. So the packages that get installed have to be available to the Postgres user. In R, if you install the packages as root, they're available to everyone on the system. If you install them as Postgres, they're available only to the Postgres user. But if you install them as yourself and then try and run PLR, you're not going to find the packages in there. So the commands, just briefly, um, in Postgres, if I create a database called GIS and then I use psql to open that database, and then I say create extension PostGIS, create extension PLR. Now these commands assume that the binaries are already on your system, either through RPMs or Debian packages, or you've done a source install. So as long as the binaries are where Postgres knows they are, looks for things like that, these commands should work fine. In terms of the R setup, when you go into R, there's a command um, install packages, which is really very useful. This will actually reach out. It'll prompt you if you're in a, even if you're in a terminal session, to pick a mirror, and then it'll download the packages, and it will actually build them right on your system. If you're in Windows, I think it downloads pre-built binaries for you. 
But um, so here, what I've done is I've created kind of this vector of all of the packages I'm interested in. And like I said, not all of these are actually used in this talk, but they're all useful. Um, so you might want to take a look at them. And then just this one command, basically, you point it at that, that vector of package names, and it just installs them all for you. OK, any questions about that before I get into the actual ingestion of data? Generally speaking, you can run anything that R can run. I, I mean, R can do some pretty wild things. I mean, R actually, there are packages that will do parallel execution and stuff like that. Um, I, I can't guarantee that literally everything will work in a sane way, but I haven't run into really any anything that doesn't work. It will use the libr.so that's on your system. I, I that I don't I don't know. I I mean I, I assume there's probably subtle differences between you know, what grass looks like versus trees, but th this is kind of a more coarse level. There, there, you could probably spend, you know, you could probably do a research project just on that one question. Anything else? Oh, hi, Stephen. <laughs> we work together, and he's another Postgres committer. Uh, okay, so, and he's seen this talk at least once or twice. Twice. So he's basically here just to heckle me. Okay, so now we're going to talk about um, the administrative boundaries. How do you ingest that data? One of the really useful um, packages available on CRAN is this RGDAL package, and it has a function called get data. And get data will go out to something called GADM, which is a database of global administrative boundaries. The link is here on the slides. Um, and it will actually pull down the administrative boundaries that you ask it to pull down right into your R session. So it's, it's actually pretty cool. So what we're going to use that function to grab the data, and then we're going to use a PostGIS table to store it. Um, and just as a side note, get data also supports um, something called World Climb, which is a database of interpolated climate data. It uh, supports some topography uh, data that was collected by shuttle missions. Um, it's got polygons for all countries. And there's some more uh, references for those things here on the slide. So now we get into some actual code. Hopefully you can see this in the back. I walked back there, and at least my eyes were good enough I could kind of read it. Uh, I, I realize that it's a bit small maybe back there. So this is what uh, a PLR function looks like. And if you're familiar with R, you would note that basically everything between kind of this double dollar sign here and the double dollar sign there, how many people are, assume this is a Postgres conference, is everyone here familiar with what double dollar sign is in Postgres? No? So, all right, so I'll step back for a second. Double dollar sign is a way to delimit a string literal. And function bodies in Postgres are string literals. The problem is if you use a single quote around, which is the kind of the normal way to delimit a string literal, but you've got something like a, a function body that may have other string literals in the other language that maybe use single quotes, then you have to start escaping them by doubling them. And that can get pretty ugly when you do something complicated where you end up doubling and then sometimes doubling again and some you know I've years ago you used to end up with like eight single quotes around things and it got really ugly so years ago Postgres started this double dollar sign thing you can anytime Postgres runs into double dollar sign and optionally you can have 
any number of characters in between, and as long as it matches on both sides, Postgres will read what's in between as a string literal, but by doing that, you no longer have to escape the single quotes inside, right? So everything inside of these is basically just R code. And this is what you're probably used to when you create PLPG SQL functions, right? Create or replace function, some name, some arguments with data types, what it returns, right? Everything from there, everything there is familiar to you. These argument names are gonna get passed into the PLR function and just get used by the R language as variables, whatever you pass in, and the data just gets converted. And I've got hour long or even longer talks just on PLR and how it works, so I can't afford to go into a lot of detail about all of that, but find me later if you want more information about that. But anyway, you can see this is a fairly short function, basically. I'm creating a, a data source name and a connection. Um, just a side note here, this, this part when you're in PLR is actually not doing anything. The reason I'm doing this here is PLR has been written so that it's compatible with a package called R Postgres. R Postgres is the extension for R that lets an R function reach out to a Postgres database. So that compatibility was added to PLR so that you could basically build this stuff in an R client. And once you get it working the way you like, you can just cut and paste it into a PLR function. So in PLR itself, this is actually a no-op because PLR is already running inside the database and it already doesn't need a connection to the database. But that's there just to be kind of complete. Um, so the, the real guts of this, you know, I'm loading the GDAL library here and the guts here is this get data function. I'm going out to this GADM website basically and I'm saying grab country equals whatever country I passed into the function, level equals whatever level I passed into the function, and I call that shapes. And then I'm using this function write OGR to basically create what's called a layer. And the translation of a layer in PostGIS is a table. It's normally a table that has one geometry column and then all of the other attributes of the layer become other columns in that table. So really, the bulk of the work is done by these two lines. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm building up a string, which is a SQL statement, to create an index on that table because OGR doesn't do that for me automatically. I'm creating an index on these two columns, name one and name two, which are basically the first level administrative name and the second level administration name. So what this all boils down to is if you look down here when I call it, I'm basically saying give me the boundaries for the USA down two levels. And I'm gonna call this layer counties, which means my table will end up being named counties. So in the US, you've got the country, then the states, and then the states are broken down into counties. So level two of the US is the counties. So what I'm grabbing here are all the county boundaries for the United States. Does that make sense? And then I'm creating a, an index on basically the state name and the county name so that I can quickly get the county that I want. And I'm probably going too slow, so. I may have to speed up a little bit. Yeah. All right, so now I'm just gonna show you how would I extract and plot. In this case, I used to live in San Diego. I just recently moved to Florida. But this whole talk was based on San Diego County because that's where I lived. So to note, something to note here is in, in these slides, when I'm, when I'm outputting a graphic, there's kind of two ways I can do it. One way is to just stream the graphic back to the SQL client and then use something that'll form it up into an actual image and project it you know, to a website or whatever. The other way you can do it is to write out a file. And I, in this talk, I specifically used both methods just so that you could see how they're done. If I use the first method, which is to stream the image back to the client, I use this library, Cairo device and GTK2, um, in order to create a PIX map 
in memory that I can basically project the image onto and then capture that buffer in order to stream it back. So you'll see this on some of the slides where you'll see this PixMap business and then at the bottom you'll see, after I actually plot, you'll see this, this part where I'm extracting the image essentially and then returning it. So that's kind of the mechanics of returning the image. But the, the actual work here is being done, um, I'm, I'm creating, it. How, it's, how many people here are familiar with projection strings or coordinate reference systems when it comes to spatial data? Sort of, okay. So this is just, this is really not fundamental to this talk, it's kind of fundamental to spatial. Um, whenever, you know, the earth is round, right? Everyone knows that? No flat earthers here? Um, so when you're looking at a map, it's flat. So you have to basically project this round image onto a flat surface. And there's a bunch of different ways to do that with varying levels of accuracy. And basically these projection strings define for any given image how it was projected to a flat. And so you have to be careful to do that in a consistent way if you're combining data to make sure it all projects in the same way. And I'll show you an example of that in a couple of slides, actually. So I'm going to say that I'm using this something called WGS84. This is like the most common projection that you run into. It's kind of like almost a standard. Um, and so this data that I'm got, I got from the GADM site is in that projection. So that's what I need to specify. And then I'm going to select a specific geometry out of my out of my table, my county's table, uh, and I'm saying where name one and name two. So basically, when I call this thing, I'm going to say I want San Diego, I want California um, and San Diego as the state and the county, and I'm just going to plot it. So that's what it looks like when I when I call this thing and I say I want from the county's layer, California, San Diego. Uh, and I call that function, and this is another kind of side note about PLR. When you return byte A from a PLR function, basically the R object itself just gets serialized and streamed back to Postgres. In the case of an image, there's a little bit of R baggage around the actual image, and PLR provides this get raw function which just strips that off so that you have just an actual image. So when you do that, you get, this is what San Diego County looks like. Note, when I get my raster data from the satellite, it's actually in a different projection. And I'm going to have to reproject San Diego County to match that so that the raster data with the vegetation index matches the boundary. So that's how you would do that. This here is how you would do that. So I'm, I've got two projections. One is the one that I originally had. And then this is the one that actually is used by the satellite. And then I can use something called SB transform to convert the projection of that and plot it. So you note, you know, when I look at that one, it's kind of in one orientation. When I look at that one, it's a different orientation, a slightly different shape. So that's gonna match the shape of the data from the satellite. Okay, there's a couple of alternative methods that I just wanted to show you to plot, to pull out San Diego County. In this case, I'm using read OGR to actually read directly from a shape file. And then in, inside of R, I'm, this is subsetting. is basically the same thing as using a, a where clause and a SQL statement, except I'm subsetting it directly in R. So this is the way that people who are familiar with R would typically do this. Similarly, I can do the same thing, except I can actually just use my PostGIS table, but I'm still subsetting it in R. The reason I wanted to show you this is because, look at the timings. The first method that I used, where I used the index in Postgres, it's pretty fast, 83 milliseconds. These other methods, you know, almost two seconds and almost 10 seconds. So if, if you're not kind of using the database the way you should be using the database and you're because you're thinking in terms of just analyzing things with R, you could fall into this trap. That's really the point here is you've got a database, you've got the capability to build and use indexes, so do that. Okay, so now we're gonna go on to the next thing, which is geocoding. 
Any questions about the administrative stuff, administrative area? Nope. Okay. So geocoding, as I mentioned earlier, is the uh, process of trans transforming a postal address into a spatial representation. So the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to create a list of addresses. I'm calling them points of interest. And I'm going to use uh, another library in R called ggmap, which will automatically go out, again, to the internet, and it'll use the Google Maps API or something called the Data Science Toolkit. Now, no, both of these are free services, but they're also both limited in how many geocoded points you can do per day. I mean, they're like on the order of like low thousands, I think. So it's not like it's really small, but if you wanted to do millions of points, you'd, you'd have to do it over like months. So th there's probably commercial services that would do this, you know, on much larger scale. Um, then I'm going to add names to these points of interest. And I'm going to, again, I'm going to set the coordinate reference system for these points of interest. And then I, I'm just similar to what I did with the administrative boundaries, I'm going to create a, a layer table using OGR. So this function create point of interest layer, and it's going to take an array of text, which I call address, and an array of text, which I call point of interest names, and then the layer name that I want to use. And I'm using that ggmap library, as well as the rgdal library. So the first thing I'm going to do is take the address. Now, when you pass in an, an array from Postgres to PLR, PLR automatically creates a vector in R. And fortunately, this geocode function in R just takes a vector of addresses and it returns the geocoded results. So that's pretty convenient. So then I'm going to simply create another um, column. This, this point of interest layer that I'm creating here is, is actually, in R terms, something called a data frame, which is kind of more or less equivalent to a table in memory. And this process is just going to add a new column called name. And I'm just going to assign the vector that was my names. And since when I pass these in, I'm going to make sure that they're in sync. You know, I've got a name for every address. So that'll just add on the column with the names for each of the points of interest. So now I have to specify, I want to turn this data frame into what's called a spatial data frame in R because all of the spatial functions know how to work on spatial data frames. So to do that, I have to assign coordinates for that, for that data frame. And I'm, so I'm saying that there's a long and a lat column that get created by this geocode function. I'm just specifying that those are my coordinates. And then I attach my projection string. And now I've got basically a full spatial object and I'm going to, exactly what I did before, I'm going to use write OGR and then I'm going to create an index on the name column basically. And that'll create my layer using PostGIS. So now when I call it, this is what it looks like. I call the create layer and I'm just setting an array for, for three addresses. And these correspond to three airports that are in San Diego Airport, or excuse me, San Diego County. And I'm going to call this layer airports. So the table will be called airports. So now this is how I'm going to point, plot that. And, um, and again, you know, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, in this slide deck, I'm doing things in different ways just to show you that they can be done in different ways. And so in this case, I'm actually not even using a PLR function to do this plot. This is all pure R code. And, and in, also in this case, instead of streaming back the bytes, I'm actually showing you how to write out a file. So if a, a name is, is um, for the file is provided to this function, I'm going to basically plot a PNG file instead of streaming it. The other thing, interactively in R and in our client, if you don't write out to a file, it's going to pop it up under the screen for you. So here, I, this is similar to what I did for the counties. I'm just going to select out the names for the points of interest. 
and I'm going to create, um, oh, excuse me, this is actually grabbing the, the administrative data here, calling it San Diego County, and it plots it. And then here I'm retrieving the points of interest. And basically, you know, I just call plot again, and it just basically adds the points of interest to the same plot that already had the administrative boundaries. And I get something that looks like this when I call it. And it may be a little hard to see in the back, but there's three red dots right here, here, and here overlaid on that administrative area for San Diego County. All right, so now I'm going to get to the actual vegetation index part of this. Now, this, is, this process is um, too long to go through in this talk. The details of the function that does this are actually in the appendix on these slides. So if you wanted to go through it in a great level of detail, you could. Uh, if you want me to go through it with you later, catch me before I leave Brazil, um, or contact me through email and we can have a chat. But I've outlined, and I'll show you kind of some screenshots, but there is a, um, a site for the uh, US Geological Services. You'll have to get a login, it's free. Um, there's a way to set search criteria for which images you want to download. And this kind of takes you through the menu items that I went through in order to pick out the set of data that I picked out. So basically, um, what I'm picking out is I wanted the MODIS NDVI, which is that vegetation index. As I said earlier, there's two satellites. I just selected one of them. It's called Terra. Uh, and I pick, I actually didn't pick San Diego County. And the reason I did that is because these images are kind of in, in um, something they refer to as footprints. It's kind of like one screenshot that the satellite gets. And in the case of San Diego County, it was actually captured in two different screenshots. So I was getting twice as much data when I used San Diego County as, a, as what I wanted. So I picked a county that was a little bit further north in California, and that gave me just one of the two that included San Diego. So that's just something to be aware of. Um, and then you, there's a, a tool that you download from their site that allows you to do bulk downloading of these, this data. So you go through that process. Now, as I said earlier, I was doing 500 meter resolution and I collected the data for I think 16 years, all of the data, and for, for this one footprint, which basically covered all of the US and it's 104 gigabytes. So it's a fair amount of data to download. If you did the higher resolution, it would have been like 400 and something gigabytes. This is what it looks like on their site. You can see this is the footprint I'm talking about. So this is kind of like one shot from the satellite. Um, there's the search bars over here and all of those, you know, the things that I was referring to here are basically, you go through the, the screens that are along these tabs and you set your search criteria and say which images you want. And then here there's a way to say, give me, you know, I want to select, it's kind of weird they basically have you, your, your search returns all these images and then you have to select every image you're interested in and add it to a, a basket, just like you were buying them even though you're just downloading them. And unfortunately, it only like gives you 25 per page and it, I had, there was, I don't know, a thousand something, 1100 I think, and I had a page through and just say select all, page, select all, and until I had them all selected. So it was kind of, yeah, it was kind of painful. And then this is what the bulk download application looks like. It's, it, you know, it's not real fancy, but it's nice in that it'll, like, it'll do retries. And basically, this, their site was not really fast for downloading from. I mean, it was definitely slower than my internet connection. And I think it took like 12 hours to download the, the 100 gigabytes. But it, this thing you know, kind of manages that process. So then the pre-processing, uh, an important note here is, this is real life data. The real life data, it's often not good, right? You get bad data. So one of the first lessons here was, you know, I, I wrote my, my function for pre-processing this stuff and I kept getting errors on things that shouldn't error out. And I was like, oh, that file doesn't look right. It turned out out of 1166 files I downloaded, Nine of them were just plain bad. You know, mo they were almost all about the same size, and those nine were like really tiny and just didn't have good data in them, so I threw them away. 
this pre-processing function basically it what it does is it loads um, the what I call the area of interest, which is the administrative boundary. So what I wanted to do is I don't you know this these images were all of the United States, and I wanted this thing to finish in my lifetime. So um, I I basically used the San Diego County outline to cookie cutter the image and just throw away everything outside of San Diego County. And so what I did was I looped through the downloaded files. I un it, they're zipped, so I had to unzip them. This file also comes with, in addition to the actual um, vegetation index, it comes with something called a QA raster and an acquisition raster. And the reason is, is that, you know, again, this is satellite data. Satellites can't look at the ground through clouds. So for every pixel in your vegetation raster, there's a QA pixel that indicates, is this data good, essentially? And so what I did was I went through all of, all of the pixels for all of the images, and if the data wasn't good for that pixel, I marked it NA, which is kind of an R, similar to marking it as a null. So any of the pixels that were not good were marked as NA based on the quality data. And then the other thing is these, these downloaded files represent a range of time. They're actually several days each. And so you could use the, um, the acquisition raster was an indication of what date a specific pixel represented so that I could kind of calculate an, an average date for a particular raster image, if that makes sense. And my dates I calculated is basically year dot fraction of a year. Um, and then later on I'll show you how I converted those into actual dates. And how am I doing for time? All right. So, uh, you know, again, this is in the, the, the actual function here is, is in the appendix. It, it was too long to go through in this talk. Uh, one note, when you call this, um, what it returns is basically a, uh, an R data frame in by day form. So remember what I said earlier, that means basically the data frame from R is just returned directly to Postgres and I just store that. And in that data frame, what I have is basically every file name that was downloaded along with my calculated average date for all the pixels in that image. The actual raster data that I processed, I wrote out to a file, I kind of cheated. I could have put that into a, into a raster um, table using um, PostGIS, but um, I actually wrote it out to something called a raster brick, which is a file representation of the rasters. So now if you want to plot that, when you get to this, these slides here, and you see this dot, 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 well, this function name matches the one I used earlier to plot the points of interest. And what I've done here is the dot, dot, dots represent the code that you saw on the earlier slide. And the stuff that I've written in are the additions in order to overlay the raster data on top of the administrative boundary and the points of interest that were already there. So in this case, I need to re-project the administrative boundaries and the points of interest so that they match the projection of the raster data like I talked about earlier. And then this part here is where I'm reading the, uh, the raster brick and then just pulling off the layer of interest. And so now when I do that, this looks like the picture you saw earlier, ex you know, with the three dots for the airports and the administrative boundary, but now it's colored. And the areas that are green are the areas with the most vegetation. And you can see, I mean, if you weren't aware, San Diego is basically right on the ocean, um, and it, you don't have to go very far east before you hit desert. So in terms of those raster dates that I told you earlier, they were in the form of kind of year and, and, and fraction of year. So this is the process that I was using first, to, to create that, turn that into actual dates. 
So first thing, um, this function is just kind of a, a, a utility function for grabbing the data frame that I returned earlier and stored in a table so that I can do something with it. Uh, and, and this is another aside. One of the features of PLR I kind of stole from PL Tickle, which is still distributed with Postgres, has this notion of um, modules table. If the modules table exists when PLR starts up, it will read the rows out of that table and essentially execute the code into the interpreter so that you can create things that are then accessible by all of your PLR functions. So what I did here is I insert into PLR modules this function that is going to take that year and fractional date and convert it into an actual date. And this, you know, this takes into account, you know, things like leap years and it gets executed by the interpreter. And since what this this R code is actually defining a function, now that function is available in my interpreter to call just like any other built-in function. So now when I create this PLR function. Uh, I'm going to pass it this an R object, which is the data frame with all the dates, and I'm outputting basically the um, the year, or excuse me, the file name and the actual date that gets calculated. And you can you see I'm using that um, PLR modules function to do the date conversion. So when I call that, you can see I get here's the name of the original file I downloaded, and here's basically the date that I calculated, which was the equivalent of the average of the pixels for that particular file. And the reason I do that is because now I can do things like, let's look at the average over time. So in this, I'm using something called cell stats to calculate the mean. And what this is doing is it's taking all the pixels that are in the raster image. So in this case, all of San Diego County, all the pixels, and it's just calculating the average. So I can get an average NDVI value for San Diego County over time. So this is what it looks like in text form, but more interestingly, I can go through and plot that. So now you start getting an idea of, you know, these are the wet times. So you'll see later when I show you the pictures that these correspond with the winter time. San Diego in winter time is when it's wet. Summertime, it's really dry. You can also kind of get an idea for, you know, which periods were, were San Diego County was in drought. But there's another function in, um, in R, which is called ggplot, which is actually really cool. It's got a very sophisticated capability for creating graphics from your data in R. And in this case, I'm going to use something called Geom Smooth to create this plot. So now this is the same data that we saw before, just plotted in a different way. Um, but it's nice because of the smoothing function, what I'm getting here is kind of a smooth line which indicates what the trend looks like. And I also get a band around it, which is kind of a, um, you know, uh, confidence interval for that line. So, so now it becomes more clear that, you know, there was kind of a, a small drought here and then a bigger drought here. And then we kind of had a couple of wet years and then back into a bad drought here. And actually I'd never did 2017, but if I did 2017, it actually got really wet in 2017 again. So now this is a function where I'm going to basically take each month in a given year and, you know, as I said, I, I have data for every few days. So if I want, I can take effectively all of the raster images for January and then average pixel by pixel. So I get kind of an average view of what January looks like in San Diego County in a particular year. So if I do that, for each month, now you can see what kind of the average looks like for a particular year 
for all of San Diego County. And so, you know, again, this is, um, you know, th this is kind of code you saw earlier where I'm setting up a, a connection string that I don't really need in this. Actually, this is pure R code, so I do need it here. Um, I'm, if you pass in a plot file name, it'll create the plot. Um, I'm selecting the, um, the dates here. I'm reading in my raster brick with all of my raster images. And then I'm looping through and I'm subsetting and grabbing for just a particular year all of the rasters and averaging them by, you can see the mean. So I'm basically taking an average by month. And then I just plot it. And when I do that, this is what I get. So this is basically January through, you know, here's August. And here's December. So you can see basically in December and January, it's wetter. And the 2011 actually corresponds with one of the years where it was wetter. And it, you can see it doesn't, you know, even in, in August, it wasn't terribly bad, but it's a lot different than it was in January. So now I'm going to do the same thing, more or less, where I average pixel by pixel, but I'm going to do it the same month by year. So this code is all the other code is the same it's just really where i'm doing my averaging where i'm selecting what i'm averaging that's done differently so i average um all the januaries and yeah so this is 2001 and i'm selecting month one so 2001 2002 through 2016 this is all january so again, you can see it kind of, you know, gets really dry here, gets a little wetter again, gets really dry in here again. Uh, I think 2011 is um, like here. You can see how green it is there. And then on, and then this is August. So that, that actually makes it kind of a, a really nice visual. You can see the difference between January and August very clearly when you look at it that way. I actually made it through all the slides and I think I have about 10 minutes maybe for questions. Three or more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the rasters that you import from the satellite have different layers, and in the processing, I selected the layer. They already do the calculation for NDVI, so I just selected the NDVI layer. They actually have separate layers for each of the different colors as well, but you could see that in the in the the pre-processing code that I didn't go through in detail you would see where I selected out the layer. It was basically, I did it for fun. I, I wanted a, a talk that would highlight these things together, Postgres, PLR, PostGIS, and, and we have you know, we have a lot of customers that deal with spatial data in various ways, and so it was kind of a, a, a nice um, way to, to show the capability of the tools. I did a blog post on this as well. I mean, a lot of what I talked about is in the blog post. You could go find it easily enough. It's on the Crunchy website, and it's linked in other places. It's just Joseph E. Conway.
Okay, anything else? All right, thank you. <laughs>